Topic video 5 interrupts, not just one of life's little annoyances. So effectively, what is an interrupt? Well, I hope to explain an interrupt to you using this simple example. So I'd like to introduce to you Pete. Pete is a really hardcore gamer. He really loves his computer games. When he plays his computer games, he dresses up in character and really gets absorbed into those games. So right now Pete's playing Sid Meier's Pirates, and he's really into the game, raping and pillaging those unsuspecting villages inside the Caribbean seas. So he's really, really absorbed into his game. But what happens is Pete's mum, yes, Pete lives at home with his mum, Pete's mum says, Pete! Take out the rubbish, please. And of course, since Pete's really absorbed in his computer game and really doesn't want to stop playing it, he just barks back, I'll do it later. To which his mum replies, You'll do it now, or no computer for a week. Well, that's a threat that Pete can't really afford to ignore. So what Pete does is Pete... Pauses, pauses his computer game, so he just puts the raping and pillaging on hold for a second and goes and takes the rubbish out. So, because Pete lives in a big flat complex with his mum, it takes Pete around about 10 minutes to finally do the job of taking the rubbish out. So he gets the rubbish, takes it all the way downstairs, puts it in the big common use bin, and then simply goes back to his computer. So a time of 10 minutes has lapsed since he paused it. Then what he does is he unpauses it, and he continues playing his computer game. So what has actually happened is there's been a break of 10 minutes between when he paused it and when he got back to playing the computer game, but as far as the computer game is concerned, no time has elapsed at all. So the pausing of that computer game pretty much suspended what he was doing. He was able to then go off and do the rubbish and come back and continue what he was doing before, raping and pillaging. So that is effectively the same thing that happens inside a microprocessor when an interrupt takes place. What happens is your microprocessor will be doing some sort of primary task that you've told it to do. It'll be happily, you know, doing something. And some asynchronous or unpredictable event will take place that the microprocessor has to deal with. So what the microprocessor will do is it will put what it's currently doing on hold. So it will pause effectively what it's doing. It will then go off and service this asynchronous, unpredictable event. And once it's finished doing that event, it will simply come back and do what it was doing before. So simply unpause what it was previously doing and simply continue on. So why do we need this whole series of asynchronous events that, that interrupt what we normally want to do? Well, not all tasks are created equal. There are some tasks that are a lot more important than others. So if there's some time-critical task, we generally make an interrupt-generated task, therefore the process is forced to deal with it then and there and can't sort of put it off to a later date. And the other, other reason is that not all tasks are predictable. If you have an external event that you're waiting for you know, it's, and you don't know when it's going to happen, it's always best to make it an interrupt-based mechanism because then you don't have to waste CPU cycles waiting for it. You simply do whatever you have to do, and then when it eventually makes itself ready and happens, then you can go off and service it. So what actually happens inside the CPU S12 when an interrupt takes place? So what originally happens is we have our processor running, merrily doing whatever task we assigned it. So it's running running our current task. An interrupt takes place, so some external event has triggered an interrupt. Our processor is paused, so even though the CPU clock's still running, our processor simply stops what it's doing. It then goes about putting all the context of, this, of the processor on the stack, so it puts the program counter on the stack, puts our <coughs> index registers on the stack, puts our accumulators on the stack, puts our condition code register on the stack, so it effectively puts everything on the stack except for the stack pointer because the stack pointer refers to the stack, therefore it must be preserved because if we put the entire CPU context on the stack, we need the stack pointer to be preserved so we can 
easily extract it at the end. So simply we pause our current task by storing those contents of those registers on the stack. Then what happens once we've stored that context on the stack, we simply disable our interrupts. Therefore, no other interrupt can take place or no other maskable interrupt can take place. So therefore, we can successfully complete that interrupt service routine without getting interrupted by any other asynchronous event. So then we simply run the current task that we want to do and then we load the program counter with the current interrupt service routine, so we find it using some mechanism that I'll come back to later, but effectively we, we detect which interrupt has triggered this event, so which interrupt triggered our process at a stop. We then grab a program counter for a chunk of code that we need to run to service that event. So we load the program counter with that particular location of that routine. Then we start the processor running, and what happens is the processor runs. It's running the interrupt service routine, therefore all the contents inside our register sets all change depending on what we're doing inside the interrupt service routine. And then what happens is at the end of our interrupt service routine, you'd like to think that the stack pointer points back to the same location it did at the beginning, so that's why it's gone blue, to, to sort of let you know that it's back to its original values. So even if you push stuff inside the interrupt service routine, you've got to make sure you've pulled it all back. So therefore, the stack pointer is the exactly the same value it was when you entered, the, entered that interrupt service routine. So it's the same rules as when you do a subroutine. You've got to make sure the stack pointer is preserved back to its original value. So our stack pointer is back. So at the end of that um, interrupt service routine, our stack pointer is back at pointing to where it originally pointed to. We then halt the processor again. Okay, so this time we've paused it again, but in order to return to what we were doing before, we simply restore the register set back to its original values. So therefore we load the registers back with the original values that they had before the interrupt service routine was triggered, or before we started running the interrupt service routine. So then we restored all those registers back, and because we restored them back to the original value, it's effectively like we never ever left our original task. We're simply back to exactly where we were before, so it's the same thing as when Pete comes back from taking the rubbish out, unpauses his game, he's back to where exactly he was when he paused it. And then of course we start running our program again, and it's like the interrupt never, never actually happened. As far as the CPU is concerned, the CPU has gone and run our task, paused, gone off and done something else, come back and run our task again. So as far as that original task is concerned, there's been no break in the time. It's simply continually happened in time, it's unaware that there's been a big gap in which we went and serviced interrupt service routine. So the C CPU 12S that we have in our side our processor actually has a series of interrupts. It has vectored interrupts with hardware pro priority resolution so we can actually define which interrupts are more important than others. Okay, and we can customize them using software. There's, so there's a series of registers that we can use to define which registers are more important, um, sorry, which interrupts are more important than others. Our processor also contains two external dedicated interrupt lines. These are the IQ and the XIQ. So we have um, an IQ pin and an unmaskable IQ pin as well. We have also numerous internal interrupt sources that are associated with our various internal subsystems. So all those internal subsystems we have, like our serial subsystems, analog subsystems, timer subsystems, and so forth, they all have associated interrupts. So they can actually generate asynchronous interrupts that we can then have code attached that we can service whenever those events take place. So when you're writing software, there's a few questions you need to ask. Do you need to use an interrupt? Are there really important events that you need to service. Okay, there are the things that have to be dealt with immediately that you can't simply wait for the code to get around to. They've got to be dealt with instantly. That's, that's the sort of questions you want to ask. If there's anything that really has to happen ASAP, so second something's made available, you need to service it, then basically you're going to need an interrupt of some kind. So you need to ask who will trigger the interrupt and under what conditions will that interrupt be triggered? Is it an internal or external source? what must be done when it occurs. So if an interrupt takes place, 
what needs to be done to service that interrupt. So obviously we want to run some code, you know, so you need to think about how you're going to attach the code to the interrupt. So when it comes to attaching that code to a particular interrupt source, there is a mechanism referred to as an interrupt vector table. So an interrupt vector table is effectively a table of pointers in memory that point to subroutines that need to be executed once a particular interrupt is triggered. So we have a table in memory and the particular location in that memory defines a particular interrupt source. So it's a hard-coded table and depending on the values you actually stick in those particular locations, so the location of the table is fixed, but the values you put in that table define where you want it to jump to in your code when a particular event takes place. So one of the most important um, locations in that vector table is the memory location FFFE, which is the reset vector. So when you turn the processor on or you push the reset button, this is the pointer to the code you want it to run when it powers up. So currently inside our programs when you write them, we have this reset vector pointing to the beginning of our flash. We have it pointing to the entry label, which is the start of our code. So therefore when you turn the processor on and you push reset, it is your code that you've uploaded that gets run. So by putting the pointer to the start of your code at the location FFFE, you basically tell it that when it powers up or when the reset takes place, run my code. And we have the other various interrupt sources, like we've got a clock monitor reset, we've got a cop watchdog reset, we've got an unimplemented opcode um, interrupt source as well, we've got a software interrupt, we've got the XIQ interrupt and the IIQ interrupt as well. So they're all particular memory locations inside our memory map. I've only listed a few here, but there are thousands and thousands, well, sorry, not thousands and thousands, but there are a hell of a lot more interrupt sources. So there's interrupt sources for all the other various subsystems on our chip. But I've included these because these are common amongst all the um, MC9 family. But then depending on what sort of subsystems you've got on the chip, these can actually be a lot, you can actually have more added to this list. Okay, when it comes to setting up the, the vector table, effectively the top elements in that table are hard-coded at particular locations. So obviously when you reset the processor, it has to be set at a particular value, so therefore it will start running your code. But once your code starts running, you can effectively change the vector table to some other memory location. So because our vector table generally consists of 255 memory locations, so there are 255 possible interrupt sources. We can put that memory, that table of 255 locations, well effectively it's 255 locations, but each location is two bytes, so it's effectively 128 interrupt sources. So we can put that vector table of 128 interrupt sources anywhere inside our memory map. So we have an interrupt vector base register that allows us to choose which one of those 255 length pages that we point, that we actually stick out interrupt vector table. So we have an IVBR register that we can set to point to our interrupt um, vector table. Okay, so basically by setting the value in the IVBR, you point to which one of those pages your interrupt vector table actually exists. So by default, the IVBR is actually set to FF because our generally our interrupt vector table is at the end of memory. Okay, so but because we have a serial monitor living on our processor, the serial monitor actually mirrors the interrupt vector table to F700 to F7FF. So effectively, if you want to use interrupt sources, you need to set your IVBR to the value of F7. Okay, because from F8 to FFF is actually write-only bit of flash. It's a protected bit of flash that actually contains a serial monitor. So the first bit of flash that we can actually write to is F7, F7FF. So therefore we put our vector table from F700 to F7FF. So you've got to keep that in mind. If you're using interrupts, set your IVBR to be F7. So what is... What basically happens is that vector table makes that connection between an interrupt source and the corresponding code that needs to be executed. So it is that vector table that makes the connection.
okay? So you write your interrupt service routine, and therefore you put the pointer to that interrupt service routine inside the appropriate location of that interrupt vector table. Generally, when you write an interrupt service routine, we, we, it's just generally just a chunk of code, like a normal subroutine, okay, that, that performs the particular task that we need it to do to, in order to deal with that particular event that's taken place. So we generally refer to this as an interrupt service routine, and we put its address, as I said before, in a particular location in the vector table, and that will ensure when the interrupt takes place, then that ISR will in fact be run. So as long as the interrupt source is enabled, the ISR will run. So by enabling the interrupt source, you need to ensure that the I bit in the condition code register is cleared to turn on the interrupt subsystems, and you also need to ensure that the particular subsystem that you're using this interrupt for has actually had its interrupts enabled as well. So you turn on the global interrupts as well as you turn on the interrupts for that particular subsystem by using one of the control registers for that subsystem. When it comes to controlling the, the interrupts, the X bit in the condition code register is useful for turning on or off the external IRQ pin, so the X IRQ pin, which is the non-maskable interrupt pin. And of course, as I just said, the I bit is used for turning on or off the remaining interrupt sources. So the interrupts will only work if the I bit is turned on, or if you're using the XIQ pin, the, if the X bit is turned on, and by turned on I mean they're actually cleared. So if the I bit in the condition code register is cleared and the particular subsystem interrupts are turned on, then the interrupt will actually take place and it will happen whenever that particular event it's looking for happens. So using the X and I bits in the condition code register, it's possible to control the entire interrupt subsystem. Each maskable interrupt, which is the interrupt that the I bit governs, can be individually disabled or enabled by setting the appropriate bits in the device's control registers. So as I said, I bit's only half the problem. You've actually got to go to the particular subsystem that you want to generate this interrupt and ensure that it's got its interrupts turned on and to ensure that the particular event that you're looking for is one of the interrupt generators inside the control register. So you look at the control registers, you find the interrupt source bits to turn on the appropriate bits to make sure that when that particular event takes place, that subsystem generates the interrupts. And when it generates the interrupts, you've got to ensure that the actual global interrupts are on, so therefore your interrupt service routine will actually be executed. So during an interrupt, the X bit inside the condition code register remains unchanged, okay, so this effectively means that when you're servicing an interrupt service routine that's generated by the IRQ pin or by some internal interrupt source, an external interrupt like the X IRQ pin can in fact trigger an interrupt. So that's good in situations where you might have something really, 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 really important attached to the X IRQ pin. So therefore when a particular event that's so, you know, life critical when it takes place, it doesn't matter what the process is doing, the process has got to stop and service it. So your XIRQ pin is, of course, your highest priority interrupt. So therefore, you'd attach it to the most life-critical, you know, external event that could possibly take place. The use of nested interrupts should be avoided because if you turn, in, if you clear the I bit inside an interrupt service routine, you effectively make it possible for an interrupt to be triggered again, which can be um, bad in situations where maybe you, an event's taken place, it's triggered an interrupt, and you haven't cleared the event to ensure it doesn't happen again, and you just simply clear the I bit, and then all of a sudden you've got another interrupt being triggered, then another one, then another one, then another one, then another one. And the downside of triggering multiple interrupts continuously is that each time an interrupt is triggered, it's pushing that context of the processor onto the stack. So effectively, each time an interrupt is triggered, you're filling up your stack by about, you know, 10 memory locations or 10 or 12 memory locations each time. So therefore, if you keep triggering interrupts, you're effectively going to run out of stack space and you'll start, you know, you'll never be able to recover from it. So it's always good to ensure that you don't turn interrupts on unless you really positively know what you're doing. And of course, interrupts are disabled on reset, so if you want to use interrupts, you've got to make sure you turn them on.
So before using interrupts, so just to reiterate some of the points I've already made, before you use the interrupts, you've basically got to make that the make sure the interrupt vector is initialized to point the point to the appropriate interrupt service routine. So you've got to ensure that you've set up that vector table before you turn your interrupts on. And you've got to ensure that if a subsystem uses the interrupt facility, then the interrupt vector must be set and an interrupt service routine provide. So if you are going to use an interrupt based mechanism on a particular subsystem, make sure you set it up properly. Okay, make sure you set the right control bits. Make sure you set up the interrupt vector table to point to that particular interrupt service routine. And then make sure you've also got the interrupt service routine written properly, which means you've got to term make sure you terminate it with an RTI instead of an RTS. So, of course, the one most important thing is you've got to make sure the hardware reset interrupt vector is set to point to the beginning of your code because if you don't set that location when you reset the process, it's going to run off into the weeds and start running some random code to wherever the vector table actually pointed to. So you've got to make sure you really got to make sure you set that FFFE interrupt vector location. So when the process is originally powered up or reset, basically it's going to run whatever it's pointed to by that FFFE location. So you've got to make sure it's set. So I've got an example here of a reset vector example. example. Um, basically, I've got a very small chunk of code. It pretty much does nothing. So I've simply set up my stack pointer, I've simply turned on the interrupts, and I've simply got a main loop branch back to itself. So simply the main loop gets to the branch star, the branch star causes the branch to the current line, so it simply spins on that line. So it's basically a chunk of code that's the very basic beginning of how your code normally is anyway. And then down the interrupt vector table, I've got an org line that, that points to the end of the vector table, so it's org FFFE, so it's actually pointing to the reset vector location in the vector table. I've then gone and done a dc.w entry, so therefore I've actually put the memory location that entry, it, of where entry is, so the memory location of where the label entry refers to. I've actually gone and told it to put that memory location into effectively the memory location FFFE, so therefore I've put the pointer to entry in the memory location FFFE. Okay, so that's how you can do a simple reset vector sort of example. And that's primarily what happens by um, default when you start up a new project and you hack it and you modify it and following the instructions given. You'll end up with something that has basic code as well as the basic interrupt vector table which has the reset vector attached to it. So inside our processor, there are approximately 128 possible subsystem interrupt sources that can be enabled or disabled by bits locally contained within the control register of the particular I/O subsystem. So you'll see, if you look at all the possible interrupt sources, so if you go to the data sheet and have a look at all the possible interrupt sources, you'll see some systems have multiple interrupt sources. Okay, and you can actually configure them inside the control register for the registers for that particular subsystem. So each one of these sources has its own interrupt vector associated with it. So each one of these possible 128 sources has its own location inside that interrupt vector table. So when an interrupt request is generated, the value located in the interrupt vector, vector table for that particular source is fetched and loaded into the program counter. So before when I did that example and we magically found the program counter value from somewhere, it actually came out of the interrupt vector table. Okay, so that's where when we do the halting and we save the context and we load a program counter value from somewhere, that program counter value comes out of the interrupt vector table. Okay, so possible interrupt sources that we have, we have an external interrupt source, the IRQ pin. So therefore, when we put a request on the IRQ pin, okay, which we can do by generating by some external logic, so simply by dragging that pin low, we can trigger an internal external interrupt. Okay, so if we simply drag the IRQ pin low, then an ISR associated with the IRQ interrupt will actually be executed. Okay, we can set that IRQ pin to be either active low, okay, or we can so we can set it to be level active or negative edge response. So we can either set it that when we drag that pin low, it continually executes the interrupts while that pin is low, 
or we can have it only generate one intrut when the actual pin is going from high to low. So on the negative edge transition, whenever that takes place, we can have it actually generate an intrut when that takes place. So we can do, set this up by using the intrut control register, which is located at 001E. It contains bits to select which response is needed and to enable or disable the IRQ pin. So the most significant bit in the interrupt control register is our IRQ enable, or sorry, our IRQ edge select pin. So we can actually select it to be edge sensitivity to be, if it's set to zero, it's level triggered. If it's one, it's falling edge triggered. So depending on the bit we put in that location, it can either be level triggered or falling edge triggered. The pin next to it is the IRQ enable. So effectively we can disable or enable the external pin. So if we put a one in that location, then in fact it's an IRQ pin. If we put a zero in that location, then in fact it's just general purpose IO pin. Okay, and delay is used for, for um, timing mechanisms beyond the scope of this lecture. It's not actually anything to do with interrupt sources. Other interrupt sources that we have are of course exceptions. Okay, and I'm just going to talk about these in, in a little bit of detail. So. In a system, there are always events that are so important that they should never be ignored, okay, and these are our exceptions. These events are usually referred to as exceptions, as I said. So exceptions, to reiterate, are events that cannot be ignored. They are like you know, life-threatening events or system-threatening events. Things have really gone haywire. Things are happening that shouldn't be happening, so therefore we need to deal with them ASAP. So. They can be things like resets, so therefore if the power drops down to a certain value and the processor resets, or if in fact the, you know, the thing's turned on or it's turned on or off, you know, a reset is effectively the hardware reset, and this usually takes place when the power is reset or firstly powered on, and it's basically the interrupt of the highest priority because nothing else is effectively running when you turn it on for the first time. A code monitor failure is effectively because our processor is a synchro synchronous device. It heavily requires the, the basically a clock working properly, continuously. If the clock f you know, fluctuates so much, then we can get things happening that we don't want to happen. So if we are, our processor clock moves around so much, it, c it can actually get out of phase with other devices in our circuit, and therefore d data gets transmitted incorrectly, and we start reading data incorrectly, and things just start falling apart. So we have an uh, interrupt service routine that can keep track of the clock. If the clock fails, then we can have it do something. So, so, so as long as we, it doesn't matter what we get it to do, but we just make it aware that we're, the clock's failed. So if in fact the clock has failed, we may in fact you know, restart the processor all over again, or you may be able to go back to some recoverable point where we knew the clock was working properly and then be able to continue on. So we've just basically got to be aware that the clock's gone, gone mad and we've got some mechanism of actually dealing with it. So basically, clock monitor failure. If the clock signal slow down or fall or fails, the clock monitor is and the clock monitor, of course, is enabled. The clock monitor will detect a problem, issue a CME reset signal. However, it is impossible for the CPU to execute the interrupt until their clock signal reappears. So if our clock stops, the processor goes, "Oh, clock's gone funny. Something's happened." It will trigger the reset, but of course, it can't actually do anything with that clock monitor failure, so it can actually run that interrupt service routine until the clock comes back. So when the clock does come back, it's like, all right, it's back now, but something went, hap went funny, we need to check to see just how bad the problem is. So you have an interrupt service routine to deal with that problem. Computer operating normally, this is um, normally referred to as like a, a watchdog timer, okay, and this is a great little mechanism. You can set the watchdog timer up. It's a basically a periodic timer that triggers every so often. So you can set it up to trigger every, you know, every second, every millisecond, every, you know, half a millisecond. Depends on how important it is to ensure that the process is running properly. So if you've got this, you've got your system working in a life critical situation where it's really important that the processor is continually working correctly, you can use a watchdog timer. And what the watchdog timer does is it effectively triggers every every uh, certain frequency, so it triggers it at, a cer at every certain number of, of milliseconds or whatever. And each time it triggers, it simply causes the processor to reset. So that's not a very good idea because then your process is effectively resetting every millisecond or whatever. But what you can do is inside your code, you can actually reset that counter. 
So therefore you can stop it from triggering. So as long as you write to two particular memory locations, or you write, a you write these two particular values to the same memory location before that timer expires, then you can prevent it from resetting. So effectively, as long as your, your code is still writing those values periodically, the processor won't reset. But then if your processor should be doing something like it's crashed or, it's, or something's happened, it's no longer working properly, then of course it's not going to be able to write those values and then of course the watchdog time will trigger, which then will be able to generate an interrupt routine which may cause your processor to simply restart again from the beginning or you may in fact be able to switch over to a redundant system if in fact it's so life critical that you know one has to take over instantly. So it's generally writing the values of AA and 55 to the COP reset register. So by writing those two values to the COP reset register, you can effectively stop the watchdog timer from triggering. So if your code doesn't do that, then of course it's going to cause it to reset. So it's a good mechanism of ensuring that your code is running properly and that your system is really robust and sort of error-free. Of course, another exception is, of course, the unimplemented opcode trap. And this is, you might think this is a silly sort of um, exception, but there are situations when your program can, in fact, branch. So you might be having it branch around inside your code based on some variable value. And it might, in fact, branch somewhere that it's not supposed to go. Or you may actually have it branching, you might actually, you know, branch into a subroutine and then RTS from that subroutine. It simply rips a value off the stack that you didn't actually use a JSR, so it's not actually a correct value that's on the stack. So therefore your code will actually start running out of memory that it was never supposed to run from. So there'll be situations where it'll actually start running. So if you get it running out of the, you know, the I.O. register set, so if you set your program counter to 000, it starts running from the register set. Effectively it'll start running those registers as if they were instructions. So there'll be situations where those those values in those I registers actually match proper opcodes. So therefore your program will so effectively be running some random program that's on the I register set. But hopefully at some point in time it'll actually start running an I register that doesn't actually represent a real opcode value. So therefore it'll go, Oop, this isn't an opcode, what the hell am I doing here? And therefore, it'll know that it's actually out of out of synchronization. It's actually either jumped to the wrong bit of memory, or it's jumped too far, or, or too, or not enough inside our um, branching. So therefore, it knows that it's sort of doing something it shouldn't be doing because now it's running an instruction that doesn't really exist. So effectively, you can have it trigger an interrupt if this event should take place. So therefore, if it starts running, you know, instructions that don't exist, you can have it simply um, trigger an interrupt, and then as a result of that interrupt, you may in fact reset your processor or you may in fact you know, try and recover it in some way. So this is another exception that's very useful for making your program that little bit more robust. The software interrupt is also another interrupt source. It doesn't really fall into the real categories of an asynchronous interrupt source because it's software controlled. So you know exactly when and where it's going to take place because you've actually got the SWI command somewhere inside your code. So the SWI command, when you put it in your code, will actually generate a software interrupt. So it's probably good in a way for doing debugging. So if you want to do some debugging of your code, you can put a software interrupt in there, and therefore it simply puts the contents on the, onto the stack, and then maybe using some code inside that ISR, you might simply want to then echo the contents of the stack out to the serial port or something. And therefore the beauty of it is you can just stick that software, and then when you do the RTI from that, it simply goes back to what it was doing before. So you can simply use that software interrupt anywhere in your code to simply do some debugging of some kind. So it's a good little tool for, for, for doing the debugging. But it really doesn't have very much practical use in, in the real world. Unless, of course, you want to f force an interrupt for some reason. Another interrupt source is, of course, the non-maskable interrupt request. And this is the um, subsystem associated with the XIRQ pin. So it's non-maskable effectively because you you can't control it using the I bit. You can only control it using the X bit. Okay, so it's not so it's effectively not maskable because it only uses the X bit and the X bit only controls this interrupt source. Okay. Whereas the I bit controls all the possible um, interrupt sources apart from the X bit. So the I bit controls the IRQ pin as well as all the in other internal interrupt sources. So
the non-maskable intra effectively refers to the XRQ pin only. Okay, so we can control the non-maskable interrupt request simply by using the X bit and the condition code register. And the most important thing to worry about is the fact that once you've cleared this XRQ bit, it's impossible to set it again. Okay, so you've got a very limited window of opportunity from when the processor resets to actually configure the X bit. Okay, once it's configured, so once that little window of opportunity is expired, you can't modify it. Okay, it's simply X bit then becomes a read only bit in the condition code register. Okay, so that with our interrupt flags or internal, sorry, internal interrupt sources, there exists many internal interrupt sources from the various built in subsystems, as I've said numerous times already. In order to use the interrupt capability of these subsystems, global appropriate so global interrupts must be enabled and the enable bit set in the appropriate control register of that I device. So as I've said before, in order for interrupts to work, the I bit has to be set. So you have to globally turn on the interrupts. Then you have to go to the particular subsystem and turn on the control bits in that subsystem to actually turn on that interrupt source. Some subsystems set a flag in a particular status register when an interrupt occurs. Okay, and if this flag isn't reset during that interrupt service routine, then effectively it triggers it again. And a good example of a subsystem that does that is the timer overflow subsystem. When the timer overflow subsystem generates an interrupt, it sets a flag in, in one of its registers. If you don't reset that flag, then the second you leave that interrupt, you're back in there instantly again. So you've got to be very careful when you're dealing with subsystems. You've got to see whether they set interrupt flags. If they do, you need to ensure that you clear them during inside your interrupt service team. If you fail to do that, you're back in there instantly again. Okay, so you've got to be very careful about subsystems and if they use flags. So I've shown here the global picture of how our interrupt subsystem looks. So we have our non-maskable I bit, which simply pumps into our priority decoder, which then, you know, generates a base address. And then we simply add that to the interrupt vector base register. So simply we generate the, the element inside the table and then we add that to the IVBR, which generates the effective address that we need to grab the, the value from to put in the program counter when we run the ISR. So there's a series of priority registers that we can then set up to configure our priority. And you can also see that our X gate processor also has a series of interrupt sources that it can then pump into the CPS12 interrupt subsystem. So we can have them both sort of vying for an opportunity to use the um, interrupt subsystem. So the X-Gate processor Copro can in fact trigger an interrupt inside the CPU-12S and then we can have interrupt service routines inside the CPU-S12 that can be there to deal purely with the, what, whatever the X-Gate Copro was doing for us. So when we're waiting for an interrupt to take place, Optimally, what we'd like to be doing is whatever we needed to do in the first place. So we'd like to be able to just simply continue on doing whatever processing we're supposed to be doing and have our interrupts sort of happen, you know, around what we're doing. But effectively, there's situations where we might set up a interrupt to take place. We might go away and do something, and then we've like got nothing left to do. So we've simply got to sit there and wait for the interrupt to take place before we can continue. So what we might want, might do while we're waiting for interrupt to take place is we might simply do a spin loop. And the simplest spin loops, of course, are the simplest way of getting the processor to do nothing. Simply while it's waiting for an interrupt to take place, we simply got it spinning on the spot. So we simply got a spin loop, which is effectively a branch back onto itself. So in this case, I've got an example loop, branch always loop, so we branch back onto itself. So we call that a spin, spin loop because it's simply spinning on the spot. We use spin loops a lot. In this case, we use spin loops to stop programs from going any further. We can use spin loops or spin locks on condition on status registers, so we might get it to spin on the spot while a particular bit isn't set or while a, bit, a particular bit is set. So depending on what, what sort of polarity that bit is set at, when a particular event's finished, we might spin on that spot you know, while it's set or while it's cleared, and the second that event takes place, like that bit is set, then we can continue on through our code. So they usually use that in a polling sort of mechanism. So with, with spin loops, of course, is the simplest thing to do. We simply have it spinning on the spot. So if you make your entire program all interrupt-driven and therefore your main program is actually doing nothing, then you just simply get it to spin. So you just do a loop always back to itself.
one of the, the better ways of doing it, I guess, is if you simply trigger up an interrupt to happen, and then you go back to your main code, you do some work, and then let's say you've got up as far as you can, go until that particular event takes place, because maybe that event's going to provide some new data for you that you need to process. So therefore, you can use a wait for interrupt command. So effectively, the wait for interrupt command will simply pause the processor at that point until a particular interrupt, until, until not a until any sort of interrupt takes place. Okay, so it's simply sitting there waiting for an interrupt, not a particular interrupt, just any interrupt to be triggered. Okay, so it doesn't matter what interrupt it is. Once one is triggered, the program will then continue on from the wait state, well, from the wait operand. Oh, sorry, from the wait opcode. So the wait. So the wait simply pauses the process until the interrupt takes place, any sort of interrupt. Okay. Wait commands are good because if you know an interrupt is going to take place, then you know the first thing when an interrupt takes place is it's got to preserve the context on the stack. So when you run a wait command, it effectively pre preserves that context on the stack, making it ready for when that interrupt takes place. So the first part of the interrupt um, process of preserving the stack, preserving the context on the stack and, and getting ready to put the program can of value in the program, so the program can of, getting ready to grab the program can of value out of the interrupt rec table. So we're up to that stage where we're just waiting for the interrupt to take place now. And then when the interrupt takes place, we're all ready to go. We simply grab that program can of value out of the interrupt vector table. We load it into the program can and we simply start running that interrupt service routine. So it does the first part of that process of preserving the, the context for us already. And it puts the CPU in a wait state, so it reduces the overall power consumption. So simply we're sitting there waiting for that particular event to take place. So it doesn't matter what interrupt takes place, it will then continue after the wait command. So you've got to be very careful. If you're going to use the wait command to wait for an interrupt, then you've effectively got to only have one possible interrupt source enabled, and it's going to be that particular interrupt source that you're waiting for. If there's another interrupt source enabled, you have no way of knowing which one is triggered, so therefore you when you continue on, you've actually got to check to see how was, which interrupt triggered it, why is it that I'm continuing on. So it's best just to simply, if you can use the wait command, to only have one possible interrupt source enabled. Another thing you can do is you can actually stop the clocks. So this is a really good power consumption mechanism, but you might think, hey, if I stop the clocks, how are my subsystems going to work? Well, in a lot of the subsystems, there are c control bits and subsystems that you can actually configure what happens to that subsystem during a stop instruction. So you can actually have it turn off the subsystem during a stop, or you can have it operate as normally during a stop. So if you've used the stop command to stop the processor, and you're waiting for a particular interrupt to take place on a particular subsystem, make sure you don't cause that subsystem to turn off when a stop command is issued. So the interrupts IQ, XIQ, and reset can remove the CPU from the stop state. Okay, and you should also ensure that the watchdog timer is disabled. Otherwise, the instruction will trigger a watchdog interrupt. Okay, so if you've got your watchdog timer happening and you've stopped the clocks, which means effectively your code isn't going to be updating that watchdog reset, so you're not going to be resetting that watchdog in time. It effectively means that the watchdog is actually going to trigger trigger a reset for you. So you need to ensure that if you're going to use a stop command you're not using a watchdog. So effectively, what is so special about an interrupt service routine? Well, as I said before, an interrupt service routine is just simply a subroutine, like a normal chunk of code, except that it's terminated by an RTI, return from interrupt, instead of an RTS, return from subroutine. So it's just simply a chunk of code terminated by an RTI. The interrupt service routine is only executed once the interrupt vector has been initialized properly, okay, and interrupts have been enabled and unmasked, and the interrupt has occurred. And then, of course, the CPU register has been pushed onto the stack, and the vector table has been the vector register vector. I guess the value out of the vector table has been fetched and loaded into the program counter. So that is the the requirements for that interrupt service routine to be run. First of all, you've got to have it initialized properly which means turning on the interrupts, turning on the control bits in the particular subsystem, um, ensuring the vector table is initialized properly, and then of course the interrupt itself actually has to occur. So we have to have the interrupt triggered, we have to have the context of the CPU pushed onto the stack, we have to have the value out of the interrupt vector table fetched and loaded into the program counter, and then we have to have the, the base of the program counter start running from that spot. And that's what will happen when the interrupt takes place. So it requires all those things to be in place for, the, for it to work properly.
Okay, when you're writing an ISR, great care must be taken when you use a stack inside an interrupt service routine. Just like when you use a stack inside an, an uh, just when you use a stack inside a normal subroutine, you've got to be careful that you preserve it ever so more when you're doing it inside an interrupt service routine. If you don't preserve the stack, if you don't set the stack value back to its original value, then of course you're going to be loading that context out of some arbitrary location in the stack, which means all your registers will be misaligned, and when you go back to running, it's going to run arbitrary code. So you really need to make sure that you preserve that stack. If you're going to jump to other subroutines inside the interrupt service routine, you've got to make sure you align your JSRs to your RTSs. Same thing, you've got to make sure that the stack it remains aligned. So when you get to the end of the RTI, it has to be pointing to that same location it was when you started, and it's ever so important that it is. Okay, so as, as I said, failure to restore it will cause your processor to go haywire. So hints to writing successful interrupt service routines are Renable interrupts in the ISR only if you need them. If you don't need them, don't turn them back on. Because when you return from that interrupt at the end, the interrupts will be automatically turned back on for you. So do not touch them inside the ISR, unless, of course, the ISR you're dealing with is a low-priority interrupt service routine. So if there are other interrupts that can, in fact, be triggered and they're of a higher priority, then, of course, turn the interrupt subsystem back on. Do not use nested interrupts unless you really have to, so do not turn the I bit back on unless you really have to. Reset any interrupt generating flags in the in an I device before you return from the interrupt sub subroutine. So if there's any interrupt flags that that sub subsystem uses to trigger an interrupt, make sure you reset them before you leave that interrupt service routine, otherwise you'll be straight back in there. So what's so special about an interrupt service routine? So you don't really have to worry about using registers inside an interrupt service routine. You don't have to push the registers before you use them. You don't have to pull them back out when you're finished. You don't really have to care about the registers at all, okay, because effectively it's already preserved them when you went there because it simply put them all on the stack already, and then when you leave the interrupt, it's interrupt service routine, it's going to put all the registers back in the CPU anyway, so you don't have to worry about preserving those those registers. You can simply do whatever you want and simply trash all the register values and have really no concern about what's going to happen when you leave it. On that note, you cannot assume any register values because you don't know when the particular interrupt took place, so you don't really know what the register values could possibly be. Of course, keep ISRs simple to begin with because IS interrupt service routines are very difficult to debug, so keep them very simple. Okay, Only make them complex when you need to make them complex. And of course, keep them short because when you're inside an interrupt service routine, the interrupts are turned off, so therefore if another interrupt is triggered, it's going to take it longer for that next interrupt to be serviced because they're spending so much time inside your ISR. So try to keep your ISR short as possible. If your interrupt service routine has to do, or basically if your interrupt has made data available that needs to be processed in some sort of complex way, then just use the ISR to make the data available to some other task that's probably running in the background. Okay, so when you get out of the out of your IS, ISR and you get back to that main program, then maybe there could be a flag in that main program to say, hey, there's some data ready, therefore process the data for me. So therefore you make the background task, the normal task, so to speak, do all the processing for you, and therefore if it's processing the data for you and another event takes place, it can simply go off to the ISR and process it so you don't have it affecting the interrupt, so interrupt service routines. So try and keep them short and try and offload all the work to, I guess, the normal tasks that might take place during a normal um, processor. So to give you a few examples of some interrupts, uses of some interrupts here, I've used, as, used the timer channel zero as an example. So I've got TCO with the um, memory location in the vector table for the TCO interrupt. Um, and then I've simply got an org ROM start, and I've simply set up the various. I've set up the stack pointer. I've set up the interrupt vector base register. I've simply cleared the interrupts. Of course, you know if the TCO subsystem actually required some configuration to say maybe turn it on, maybe make that channel um, active, then of course I've left that code out. But that would be added in there as part of the initialization before I turned on the CLI before I turned on the interrupts. And then I simply get the main loop and I branch always back on itself. 
So therefore, inside the TCO ISR, I've simply got it doing a knob and then returning. So it's a very simple interrupt service routine, which effectively does nothing. But what it shows you is it shows you an example of how you might edit the interrupt vector table. So what I've got is I've got an org TCO line, and then I've simply put the pointer to the TCO ISR in that particular memory location that TCO refers to. And then, of course, underneath that, I'd probably have an org, you know, dollar FF. FE and then simply have the reset vector in there as well pointing to entry so I'd simply have the interrupt vector table consisting of those two elements one for the TCO and one of course for the reset so one thing to keep in mind with this slide is effectively that I've moved the value of FF to IVBR okay I've moved the value of FF because as the name says under the another example heading it's a virgin system which means it doesn't actually have a monitor therefore we have the vector table located at FF00 to FFFF but because we have a system with a serial monitor in there and we don't actually have access to that last part of our memory map it's going to be different for our um, systems when we actually write our interrupt vector table. So when we're actually using it with the UBUG12 which is the name of the serial monitor that we have on our processor the example is exactly the same as what we had before with one change and I've highlighted that change it's effectively when we're doing it on the UBUG12 system we set everything up as normal except we change the value for our IVBR we set our IVBR value to pick to be F7 okay and therefore that will point our our um, interrupt vector base to the memory or the memory page F700 to F7FF. So there for our vector table, vector table is at F700, F7FF. Okay, so, and the other thing worth mention, noting on the slide is the fact that the location for TCO is in fact still FFEE. So one thing you've got to keep in mind here is that because we've got a serial monitor, what happens when you upload your code to the serial, to the um, ADAPT 9S12X is, it will upload your code where you tell it to put it. So it'll simply put your code into the 4000 region. So it'll simply stick it into the flash. So your org line, you know, org line that tells you, we, you know, basically what is it, um, ROM start. It points to 4000. So therefore your code will end up in the memory location 4000 to however long your code is. But what it does is it actually sort of grabs your vector table. So if you've got a vector table that points to FF, you know, somewhere in the FF00 to FF. FF, so if you've got a vector table in that region, the serial monitor will actually then grab that table and automatically translate it, so therefore that table will appear in the F7 memory page. So the serial monitor actually translates the anything, in the, anything destined for the FF page to the F7 page automatically for you. And if you explicitly define it to be the F7 page, then you can get some you know, undesired results happening. So therefore, when you write your code, point the IVBR to F7, set your vector table as if it was going to go into the normal location of the FF page. Okay, so if you set up FF page, the serial monitor will translate it for you to the F7 page. So very important to keep track of is that you just write it as normal, so point it to the normal FF page, but simply change the IVBR to point to the F7 page. So to recap what happens during our interrupt process, to sort of inter incorporate all the stuff that we've talked about so far, we effectively have our processor running so he's simply doing whatever task we've assigned him to do we have an interrupt triggered okay so the process is halted we then have the entire context of our CPU being pushed onto our stack okay so therefore our, con our pro program is effectively paused We then, because this is an IRQ interrupt that triggered, we simply then go to the interrupt vector table. We get the value of our IRQ um, memory location. We get the, the, the pointer that points to our IRQ ISR, and we simply grab that and we put that in the program counter. Then we simply go back and we start running that interrupt service routine. Okay. When we've finished, our stack pointer returns to its original value, so we've preserved our stack, we've ensured the number of pushes and pulls is equal, the number of JSRs equals the number of RTSs, and so forth. We've ensured stack alignment. So once we've finished the ISR, we execute an RTI, so therefore our processor halts, and we simply go back, returning our
context back to its original values. So as you've noticed, one thing to keep track of here is the fact that when we preserved the condition code register, the iBit was not set. The iBit was already cleared. So when we've preserved the condition code register, the iBit is cleared. And then after we've preserved it, we've then set that iBit, which, which, which actually disabled the interrupts. So now that we've then gone and restored the context, like restored the condition code register back on to our normal condition code register, it effectively will clear the iBit for us. So therefore the interrupts are now automatically re-enabled. Okay, so now everything's all back to normal. Our context is back to its original values. And now our processor is happily running, doing whatever it was doing before. So, like normal, should you require any further assistance, please do not hesitate to ask your demonstrator, post a question on the forum, email me the convener, or make an appointment to see me, you know, ask me a question after the, after the tute, knock on my door, hound me, I don't really mind. Just please ensure that all your questions get answered.